Hello, everyone. This is uh, John Byrne with Poets and Quants. We have a special webinar today uh, that obviously is very timely given the days and weeks uh, events since the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. I think the world has wakened up to a lot of um, in inequality and unjust behavior that has existed for a very long time has largely been swept under the rug and ignored. And what we're going to focus on is the role of higher education and economic uh, inequality. I've always believed that, you know, the road to a more fulfilled life is through higher education. Um, it's a way to grab social mobility uh, and to uh, make your, the promise of your life fulfilled. Um, and we have three terrific guests to talk about um, the role of higher education and what, how, how it's failed us too, uh, because I think it has failed us. You know, on Sunday, the Dean of the Harvard Business School uh, admitted um, that the school failed in, in uh, leading a conversation about meaningful change and actually reforming its own house with very few African-Americans who are on the faculty, incredibly few African-Americans who are students in the MBA population of Harvard Business School, and very few protagonists in the case studies that the students study uh, who are black. So let me uh, welcome um, three terrific guests. I wanna uh, go straight to James Lowry first and tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he's the author of uh, a new book called Change Agent, A Life Dedicated to Creating Wealth for Minorities. Uh, and indeed, he's had an incredible uh, life himself. He was, in fact, the first African-American recruited to McKinsey & Company. That was way back in 1968. Long time ago, huh? <laughs> he's a Harvard Business School MBA. Uh, and... Um, he uh, was a special advisor to BCG after he left McKinsey. He had his own consulting firm, in fact. Uh, and one of the many things that he did while uh, running his consulting firm was he forged a strategic partnership with Ford Motor Company uh, that led to Ford sourcing more than $3 billion in product and services to minority businesses. Uh, he also is uh, or was an adjunct uh, faculty member at the Kellogg School. So James, welcome. And then we have uh, Stella Ashayalu. And let me tell you a little bit about Stella. She's the founder and CEO of an organization called We Solve, which connects uh, minorities with companies um, in, in the hopes of getting them recruited and, and getting them into executive positions. And we also have uh, Paula Fontana, who is the Vice President for Strategic Programming Initiatives at the National Black MBA Association. Uh, all of them have MBAs. I don't. <laughs> I'm the only negligent one here. Uh, so welcome. So let, James, let me start with you because you have the perspective of, uh, of a lot of history and a lot of history during a time when um, there was a civil rights revolution and um, and there was a president at, at the time who granted a lot of rights, but yet very little has changed. Why? Oh, that's a difficult question to answer in five minutes, but let, let me give you the try. Uh, I think there are many reasons. And, and what I tried to do in my book to give my perspective from a 60 year journey. Uh, and I should add, you know, that part of me and my concepts and my feelings came also from my experience of being six years in the Peace Corps, where I was also associate director in Lima, Peru. And before that, I'd served in, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So right out of college, I, I, I went overseas. And so they had a tremendous impact on me. Mm. And I went back with McKinsey later on as a, as a consultant and we decentralized government in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So I had a 10 year period of time between that. And I think the fact that I was McKinsey and getting the Harvard kind of education and experience and exposure, coupled with the strong feelings I had towards helping the people less fortunate than myself, really influenced my whole life. 
Yeah. And that's been my journey. And that's why I made the title the way it is. So I think part of the reasons that I think we have not made the advancements we should have, and I said in my book, they might even be controversial, that too often, I think in the past, we focused on the social and economic issues confronting the black community. And we did not focus on the economic issues. And we did not deal with the reality of dealing in the world's largest free enterprise system in the world. And I think we were all at fault at that. I was part of it and other people were part of it. And that we don't deal with economics. And so when I, when people, all the statistics start coming about covert, and I'd seen those statistics before in terms of disproportionate number of people who were sickened and the disproportionate number of people who were, who were killed, it was an economic issue. It, it's more than a medical issue. And so we have led about 40 years, the civil rights movement opened the doors. We opened the doors for a lot of different protected groups. We did not take advantage of it economically. So when you think about the west side of Chicago, the south side of Chicago, there's no economic activity. There are no major jobs. And so that's what I was trying to argue in the book, that I think we have to do both. I think education, there are two roads to change. And education is obviously one. I think the other is economic investment and growing of businesses of size that can employ, inspire, be the models for young black people. And we have not done that well. And we lost a great opportunity over a 50 year period of time. So many of the problems that beset the black community are, are symptomatic in fact, we don't control capital. We don't control business. We do not control commerce. And so what you have is the frustration. Well, I'll never condone never condone duty in, in many of our communities, but I can understand it. I can understand it, uh, why it's occurring, because economic developments never occurred. So I think we have to go forward. And once we have capital, we will have power. And once we have power, we can affect change. Without capital, without power, it's going to be the same thing 20, 30, 40 years. From I won't be around, but that's why I should be around. Paula, why hasn't higher education delivered as well as it could have? Why hasn't it been more, uh, a more effective tool in social mobility for African Americans? Um, great question. And I want to touch on, I guess, a, a big word that James just used, and that is um, mobility as well as having someone who looks like you. So if there is not someone who you can um, look to who looks like you, who is teaching you, who is a professor in the system, who can help to um, be a mentor to you as you go throughout the program, letting you know the do's and don'ts, and oh, by the way, um, pulling you into their network. Because of course, it is through networking that you're able to get to a higher level without those types of things um, the buddy system, if you will, then there will always be a failure in the system. And so within higher education, I would say that um, it needs to first look in the mirror. So what do your professors look like? What do your higher level administrators look like? Um, do they look like the community in which you are trying to serve? And if they don't, then perhaps the change needs to start with you um, because that is really the perfect system and the environment where change and culture and differences and equality should be embraced. Uh, and so it is unfortunate that it has not quite yet um, started there. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, it even goes down to sort of the institutionalized racism in our lower education system where those school systems are uh, systematically underfunded. Right. And you don't have uh, the sort of guidance and support uh, from those schools that's necessary to help people succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, Stella, what, what's your sense of, of the role of higher education? I mean, you recruit a lot of um, college graduates, including MBAs for companies. Um, wh what's your sense of the pipeline and why it's not larger? I think... I think that's a very loaded question and a, and a great question that we always get. And so I'll address one element of it. 
When we think about the pipeline and that being kind of part of the issue as far as contributing to diversity in the workforce or in the workplace, um, I think that's just one small element of the story. There's a finite number of, you know, Black, Latino, or just underrepresented candidates at these MBA programs. But we all know that those underrepresented uh, candidates have a harder time finding roles than a lot of their white peers. They have a lot harder time getting recruited by a lot of these companies that are, you know, claiming and saying that they want more diversity in their organization. And there are a number of reasons um, for that beyond just education. But to the point that you kind of made um, previously, this is something that's systematic and that starts so early. So it's not something that is just rooted in higher education or higher learning. It's something that has been, you know, um, following and, and, and trailing these candidates throughout their entire education experience. And so when they get to, you know, this, these MBA roles or MBA uh, positions and are later looking to, to find roles with these companies, they have those same systematic uh, barriers or obstacles, um, whether it be, you know, inherent bias or lack of access or, you know, the inability to have certain experiences that companies are looking for. And then from a pipeline standpoint, similar to, you know, as, as a tech startup, you know, we're out here grinding for, you know, investors, they're looking for certain patterns to say that's the type of company that I want to invest in, or that's the type of founder that I want to invest in. And these higher um, education institutions are doing the same thing. These are the patterns of what top students look like. You know, what your GPA was for undergrad, what type of undergrad you went to, what type of work experience you had, you know, what your essay says, what scores you get on certain tests. And those are not actually real predictive indicators of a candidate's ability to be successful. And so that just continues to be perpetuated. And that ultimately is what is limiting, you know, the, the numbers of underrepresented candidates in these higher, um, higher education institutions. Yes. Um, and, and if you don't mind, um, no, so that's a great point. Um, we actually commissioned a study with Goizueta's business school to look into um, Blacks and GMAT test scores, for example, why they had been um, historically so much lower than other ethnicities and realized that with those lower test scores, that follows you throughout your lifetime um, trajectory. So that results in not getting into the higher um, top ranked business schools, as well as reduced scholarship opportunities and, and career advancement. So you're absolutely right that um, those types of things, which aren't necessarily indicative of how well you will do in the program, follow you throughout your entire lifestyle or life cycle. I think those are two great points. And I'm going to piggyback on using personal experiences. You know, uh, one, you're absolutely right in terms of the scores, because I will confess that I got to Grinnell College not because of my SAT scores. I was, I had a, you know, I went to a private school, I was a B student, and I was an athlete, but my scores were not high enough to get in. And so it was, but it was not indicative of the size of my heart or my real intelligence to perform at a high level, which I did do. And I thought that for the longest time. And the little footnote in, in history there is Don Stewart, who went to Grinnell College with me, who got a PhD from Harvard, later became the head of the school board, I mean, the college board. He did not have high enough board scores to get into Grinnell College. He was a provisional admin. So I think we should really take that on. And, and she's both of you are absolutely right. I think the other thing somebody mentioned about, I, I think it was you, uh, uh, Stella, who's mentioned the fact about people say, or maybe it was you, Paula, talking about having people they can see. Mm -hmm. And going back to Harvard, I remember Dean MacArthur asked me that, as a consultant to bring in more black professors or do a search for more black professors. They didn't have any. They had one at that time, Jim Cash, 
who had a tremendous career at and went on to go on Microsoft's board and other people's board. Generally, I remember him. Yeah, and he's yeah. just a fantastic guy, and he's done extremely well. So I went out and stole a black professor from Wharton, and his name is David Thomas. Davis Thomas went to Harvard. He had an outstanding career. We as black alums endowed his chair. He then later went on to head up the business school at Georgetown. And guess where he is now? He is now the president of Morehouse. So I think we can open up these doors if people want them open. And if you open up the doors, I think that, that it, it, we can show that we can demonstrate the same abilities of others. And the only other thing I would say, because it's so close, I think historically black colleges have done a great job in terms of really moving the needle. If we didn't have historically black colleges, uh, I don't know where the nation would be, you know, in terms of that. And what scares me to death is to see how vulnerable many of these schools are. I've done research in terms of the size of the endowment, with the exception of maybe six schools. The average endowment of all historically black colleges is six million dollars. At Grinnell College is 1.3 billion. So unless we look at the economics of historically black colleges, we're going to be in bad shape. I think the other thing that is also missing is not only higher education, but many of the people that, that several of you mentioned who are now captains of the industry, they started in prep schools. They started at Exeter. They started at Groton. They started all these places. And Thank God for a better chance, which I've been very involved with. And, but if those people, and when you look at the most powerful people in the black community in business, most of them started in prep school. So to open the door, and I had professors, or I, had, I didn't have professors, I had teachers cuss me out when we designed a better chance to get people into those seats. And they had the audacity to say, I don't like you because you're taking the seats that we've had for the last hundred years. Wow. I want to get back a little bit to, about the assessment test, like the GMAT and the GRE for yeah. uh, business school, and uh, why the barriers to diversity and inequality in higher education. I mean, part of part of this is um, rankings by U.S. News, which figure uh, these uh, numbers into right. high school ranks. Part of it is the false belief that uh, a standardized test uh, is equivalent to some sort of intelligence test, which is not right. true at all. Uh, and part of it actually is the way questions are asked and the, and, and the uh, structure of the exam itself. Um, what to do about it? You left out one more. What's that? Fundraising. Oh, yeah. Your alums take great pride in these ratings. And if those are the, are the criteria being used that gets money in the door, usually it's going to take a very bold president to say it's not important. Yeah, that's really true. I, I think that's, that's exactly it. it. At the top of this problem, it goes back to economics and it goes back to yeah. the dollars. Yeah. These schools are all working towards getting their um, enrollments up, getting higher test scores, getting more, um, you know, donations and, and commitments from alumni, um, being perceived as a better institution, all for the purpose of more dollars. And scores are directly tied to that. Um, and these universities, they all would like to see more diversity, but not at the cost of scores not at the cost of rankings. And so it's the same problem when you think about why corporations are not bringing in more diversity, why universities are not bringing in more diversity. They all want more, but they want something else more than they want that. Yeah, true. And, and I would say that um, if we were to look or examine how to get the test scores up, then I would encourage us to begin earlier in the pipeline than perhaps we would have. And so I would encourage um, those who are interested in, in getting those diverse candidates to start as early as high school 
led educating them on the types of roles, the types of opportunities that could exist further down the road. So as well as assisting them with uh, the appropriate test taking um, techniques in order to increase their scores, because it's not some, as someone just mentioned, it's not necessarily how smart you are, it's how well you take the test, how fast you take the test, how, um, how, how many accurate answers you get. And so if we start earlier at the pipeline and educate our students on how to take those tests so that they can increase their scores, then I believe that they will, as well as encouraging them to take it as early as um, tests such as the GMAT, as early as undergrad, before they've even graduated while their minds are still fresh, while those mathematic um, equations and things are still fresh on their minds because it will last up to five years. And that way when they're ready to, after they've been in the uh, workforce for a couple of years and are ready to move on to graduate school, then their uh, test scores would be higher than they would have been if they had just taken it a couple months prior to entering the program. Right. I'd like to push us though, just to challenge us to even, you know, take it a step further. I think similar to why we haven't seen any change in the United States for the past 60 years is because we try to address symptoms rather than the root problem or the root cause. And so while we can get the test scores of African American and other, you know, underrepresented groups up, if fundamentally those tests and those scores are not indicative of intelligence, if they are biased, are we not just putting a Band-Aid on a problem? And while I know it's a, you know, this is such a, a magnificent problem that I don't think there's any one approach that is going to completely, you know, solve it unless we literally scrap it and start all over. Um, it's going to take a number of different, you know, approaches, but I just want to challenge us to think a little bit more, you know, radically in how we shift, you know, you know, acceptance and, and, and access to higher education. Right. Uh, James, um, I want you to pretend that you're the dean of the Harvard Business School. And I want to ask you, what are the three most important things you can do as a dean of the Harvard Business School to increase the diversity of the school? Yeah, I, I think, well, one, uh, and I saw it happen. I mean, if you go back in history, I, I'm also old. I can always talk about history. But <laughs> I remember when there were no blacks on the campus. There was no, no blacks. And when I was at McKinsey, you know, I could walk in the campus. You wouldn't see any blacks. Yeah. I mean, clearly, you didn't see many women. And what happened, and, and I have to give Harvard credit, but they came out of a program called Cognit. And what happened, it was a grant from the Sloan Foundation that gave a million dollars to 10 top business schools. And with those million dollars, they brought in people. So it gets back to what Stella, it always comes back to money. Yeah. So Harvard had a million dollars to bring in students. That, they became the first scholars at Harvard who were black and brown. And they were called Cognit Fellows. Now, after the money ran out, I have to give Harvard credit, they did come back and said, we'll put our own money. So first thing, you gotta, you gotta put your own money on the table to get people in. Secondly, it's along the same lines in terms of bringing in more David Thomases. It's right now, I think maybe Harvard has two tenured professors, you know, two tenured That's professors. Good. So one of the issues we should be thinking about, and, and Stella, this is in your area, but it's not only getting more in, it's making sure they get to the top and they get tenured. In the case of business, how many become partners? So when I started the diversity and inclusion at BCG, there were only 11 black people in, at BCG. And one of them was John Legend. Most people don't realize that. It was John Legend. And so he was this young kid from the University of Pennsylvania. Now we have, and this is true for McKinsey, Bain, all the rest of them. The last retreat, we had over 360 students, I mean, uh, members. How many are partners? So it gets back to somebody said earlier, if you have partners, they have clout, they have control over money, they have, they're at the table, okay, they can bring in other people, and they're the models for these young people coming in. So I, I think that's the other thing, making sure not only you get more people of color who are on faculty, but make sure that they're guided to where they have tenure, and they can be part of the institution. 
I think the third thing, which is very important, and we got to be very candid, you know, what's going to be the road once you get there? How do you leverage that experience at Harvard, Wharton, or Stanford? And I remember, you know, being very candid, but I used to recruit there, and I would be with all the black students in their second year, and I would ask the question. I said, how many, how many of you people have, you know, roommates or uh, cam mates who, whose father was the head of a CEO of a major corporation or head of state at Harvard? <laughs> and we didn't have it. How many people have been professors who will sing you, you know, your, your, your praises when you leave? Well, I don't have anybody. And I said, then it, I went to another one. I said, well, you wasted two years in Harvard. The, the education is basic. Harvard is there to leverage the use going forward for the next 20 or 30 years. So I think we have to be honest in saying, you know, once you're there, how do you leverage these two years so that you can be the asset not only for your family, for yourself, but for the black community for the next 10 and 20 years, because you're going to have that degree. And I don't think we do a good job. Of it. I think we all could do a much better job of telling the truth of what a two year experience at Harvard is and what they mean. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, there are 300 cases that a first year Harvard MBA student has to absorb. Only two of them have African-American protagonists out of 300. Yep. yep. I mean, if you, if you don't, this goes back to the whole role model uh, issue as yes. well. If you don't see people before you who are successful, uh, that's a problem. Sure. Paul, let, let's have you assume a role as well now. Let's say you're the director of admissions. So how do you put forward the dean's suggestions and how do you add to them to increase diversity of, and we're just going to use Harvard Business School as an example because uh, it, is, it is an example. It should be doing a hell of a lot more than it does. And it's a big disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I would say is to partner with diverse organizations um, to help us get there. So whether that be like a, uh, a National Black MBA Association, the <laughs> consortium, MLT. So these types of organizations where there are diverse candidates that we can pull from within the pipeline. So that's absolutely one. And then also um, a big networking resource, of course, is my alum. And so making sure that we are connecting with our alum, letting them know about the diverse initiatives, encouraging and even incentivizing them to encourage their diverse uh, people within their diverse networks to apply and to be successful because then they would help shepherd them along the process so that they are successful and um, get the job that they want. So those are the two things that I would do as head of admissions. All right. And Stella, we're going to continue this role playing here. We're going to make you the head of career management. Uh, and, and how do you succeed in getting African Americans that are brought in now by James and Paula uh, to, to assume important roles in the companies that come to recruit on the campus? I feel like, I feel like that was a softball for me to wave. We saw, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, honestly, the the career centers they can't do it alone, um, but they have a responsibility to one, not only prepare these candidates for what they really will be experiencing out there and you know the different experiences that they might have um, in comparison to their peers, but two, um, it's to partner with the organizations or the companies that make a commitment to diversity. And what I mean by that is telling organizations that wanna come and, and recruit on campus if you want to recruit on campus at Harvard, then we want to make sure that you have a diverse slate of candidates that you're recruiting and bringing into your organization and demanding that because trust me, they're going to want to make sure they can recruit at Harvard. So it's, it's putting your money where your mouth is mm -hmm. and holding those other organizations responsible. And then, like I said, you know, just thinking about what we solve does and what companies are looking for. Companies are looking for a way to feel comfortable about the candidates they bring into their organization, that those candidates will perform well, and that those candidates will lead and contribute in their organizations. Giving those candidates opportunities to showcase that to these companies 
to ultimately reduce that barrier or that bias and ultimately um, allow them to bring more candidates into their organizations is something that I think is really critical and is exactly why we self takes the approach that we do when it comes to connecting companies with diverse candidates. That's great. You know, I think Stella, a lot of could I have a question to Stella? Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with everything you said. One of the things I would ask you as, as a professional in this area, what about the kid who didn't, or the woman who did not have a high GMAT score, but you were able to observe, or Harvard was able to observe, they had that right whatever if, that they could do things, they got things done. Because I think what has happened, and correct me if I'm wrong, both of you, is that too often we still rely on the GMAT scores and how well they did, you know, and, and that's part of their record. And I would say being in this space, you know, at McKinsey and my own firm and, and later BCG, that often the people who had the highest GMAT were not very successful in navigating the, the environment in which they were working. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough thing. And they scored well, but when they got into these cultures and they're tough cultures, they're political cultures, they're analytical, you know, challenging cultures. There's a lot of things that are going on. You got to have street smarts as well as academic uh, brilliance to be able to make it. And I think too often we go for the GMATs and not look for those other things in these kids. Yeah. And that's especially true in consulting, where consultants are asked, before they're hired, that is, right. what your GMAT score was. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, I'll take it further and say, you know, it seems like some of those folks with the higher scores, there's actually data studies that show that uh, scores, as well as GPA, is not correlated to success in roles. And that's across the board, regardless of your, your race or your ethnicity. Yeah, sure. And so it kind of begs the question then, why are we still using this as the barometer? Um, but I think, you know, you hit it right on. The candidate who does not have the highest score or the highest GPA, they need access and opportunity to not only learn what's required of them in these various roles, but the opportunity to showcase that they have the grit, the stamina, the intelligence, you know, all of those skills that are actually important to being successful in a given role, they need those opportunities to showcase that to these companies. Um, these opportunities to um, further develop and to show that they can not only compete, but can excel in these roles. Yeah. Very true. And uh, I think that students can showcase those types of skills in case studies, for example. So working with companies one-on-one um, -on -one where they can analyze, interpret data, make presentations to senior level executives. That way they see how they come across um, and it's not all about the score. So that's one way that they can do it inside of school. Um, another way is working with the career management centers as those companies begin to come on campus and they network within um, those different settings, then there's someone inside of the company who can speak for them on their behalf. And then, of course, once they get out of school, um, the thing that we've talked about many times is sponsorship or having someone who is an influencer inside of a room where decisions are being made who can speak to that candidate's behalf. So those are the ways that you overcome um, the low scores. Or, or working with WeSolve and working on challenges through WeSolve. <laughs> there you go. All I want right. to go back to something that Paula said earlier on about role models in teachers. Um, because I'm thinking that uh, some black applicants can look at a given school's demographic and say, ask themselves, do I belong here? Because there are just so many white faces or Asian faces and very, very few blacks. Um, do you think that's a problem, James? Yeah, I, I think it is, but I, I think we'd have to be honest. I mean, through my career, and I'm sure through theirs, we've had some very strong mentors and, and, and sponsors who were white. So I think it, it's very important. And I say this when I, when I advocate, you know, blacks going on boards. I said, I don't want a black just on, to be there in number if they can't articulate what diversity is all about. 
and they're just taking, you know, checks and moving on to the next board where they don't say anything either. I don't think that's moving the needle and helping black people just having a number. I think the same thing is true in terms of having black professors. I think it's important to have, I will always fight for it. I've been on Grinnell's board for years. I always fight for that. And we've increased the number, but I think more importantly is the heart of that black person who's a professor. And most of these kids understand who really cares for them, who really supports them and loves them. And unless you get that in that faculty member, you're gonna have a hard time. But I think the other thing more importantly is what do these faculty members do after the classroom? Mm -hmm. After the classroom. That is the most important, or anybody, any, any, the white professor, what do they do? So right now, you could probably say, you know, you're not working at, you're not at Harvard and the graduate board because nobody's on campus. But I think doing this kind of crisis, and we've had crisis before, who was there to help these kids at this very, you know, daunting environment and make them feel good, worthy, and, and motivate them to continue on the ballot? I think that is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Right. I like what you said it's about the heart of the educator yes mm -hmm. yeah that's really true uh james do you know uh, a man by the name of stephen rogers stephen rogers is a very dear friend okay okay that's very good and his wife worked for me oh okay i didn't even same place like and his wife his ex-wife is working with now we have an academic program at kellogg now training entrepreneurs I've had it since 1996, <laughs> and who who was the star in 1996 when I when the first year he taught at Kellogg, and it was the first year of my program with Stephen Rogers. Is that right? Okay, I'm going to mention him because I had a conversation with him earlier today. That's my buddy uh, about uh, Dean Nitten um, Noria's statement. And you yeah. will then recall that, you know, uh, for everyone else who doesn't know, Stephen Rogers taught entrepreneurial finance at Harvard Business School for seven years. He retired or resigned uh, last year out of frustration right. at the school's inability to make any kind of progress despite uh, his repeated attempts to get them to recruit more faculty. Yes. Uh, and in one uh, case, which really outraged him, uh, the school appointed uh, someone to the position of managing director of admissions who had little more than two and a half years of work experience after getting his MBA at Harvard uh, and in doing so passed over an extraordinarily talented black woman, Shari Hubert, who at the time was at Georgetown in, uh, in admissions. She's now at the Duke Fuqua School in admissions. Um, she had recruited for the Peace Corps. She had worked for GE, City, and BCG. Her right. credentials are amazing, and she was passed over in favor of really an unqualified white man who had no experience in admissions or recruitment at all. Right. Which was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back and, and really made him just enraged and ultimately leaving Harvard Business School. Um, the lesson here is this, right? Why does this keep happening? Why, why do unqualified people uh, get promoted and moved, moved up because they're white or because they have a connection over other people who are similarly qualified or better qualified who don't get the job? Isn't that a rhetorical question? Because, come on. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a setup. I mean, you know how. I mean, and, and let's just use, and I, I'm sure, you know, Michelle would not be upset if I brought this out. Michelle was the Dean of Admissions at Kellogg. And she, you know, and, and she, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, we talked about it last week. She discovered that there was this secret list of, of or scholarships that people for years had been given to people when they thought it was necessary for faculty, for alumni relationship or whatever. It was like a list. X number of people get in. Then they had the interview and all like that. But it was a separate category left. Up. And she used that when she was the dean of admissions to increase the number of black and, and uh, male and female. She did. Yeah. And the, what your very your point is, some of these people that that got in through her good work and her objectivity, and she was tough because at Rick Kellogg you had to have personal interviews. You had to have personal interviews. You couldn't get in. 
That's so right. She was, she was conducting a lot of these interviews. I'm so proud of her, but I'm proud of the fact that who are the people she recruited. One of the guys at BCG is the highest ranking black at BCG came through Kellogg and he's the first black that ever had open up a office in BCG and he's in DC. His name is Justin Dean. Right. But because it was because somebody mentioned MLT, it was MLT and John Rice. Right. We got him into Kellogg. We got to Kellogg because of Michelle. Okay. We're talking about two people who, who paved the way. He took advantage of that opportunity. For me too. He had double engineers at Virginia. He's a very smart kid. But he's doing extremely well, and he's having a tremendous impact. And in soon, we'll probably see more people of color, more women in the D.C. office in the history of the firm. And guess what? We're going to make as much or more money under his direction. <laughs> yes. Okay? That's the bottom line. <laughs> yep. It does come back to money. Paula's up there. She's just shaking my head at me. She said, where'd you get this guy from, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, Paula, what role? <laughs> I, can you I, I was shaking my head because I think you're right. It, I mean, it really was a rhetorical question, right? The, right. The, the heart of the matter is it keeps happening because racism is still a thing in this country, okay. unfortunately. Paula, what role can the association play in lobbying uh, business schools to do a better job uh, at diversity, recruitment, support, encouragement, scholarships. What role can the association play? Um, and I assume you mean my association, yeah. right? Um, so uh, a few things, a different approach with different partners. So first, it is um, from the education standpoint, working with our um, collegiate partners, whether they be HBCU or predominantly white institutions, figuring out how we can best support and or supplement their resources. So that could look like um, using our members and our networks um, to help them learn how to write accomplished based resumes or how to conduct interviews or how to appropriately do video interviews, whatever the need is. Um, that we can use our resources to help supplement whatever it is they need, but then at the same point, having some really um, tough but much needed conversations with our corporate sponsors on the other end. So understanding what their needs, their business needs are, and then shining light on the amazing talent that we do have within those colleges and universities so that they get the access um, to those opportunities as well. And then also encouraging them to, uh, to, break, um, to embrace diversity as well as inclusive so that the, the way that people get promoted, um, that the color of your skin or the way you necessarily show up because of the color of your skin will not deter you from moving up within the ranks of the uh, various companies. Right. Uh, Stella, you've seen Bank of America and Goldman Sachs make, make these big announcements of uh, setting aside money to put against uh, racial inequality. Um, do you have concrete ideas for companies like that who want to make a difference in what they should really be doing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's kind of the first step. It's going to take resources to make a change. And if these companies really value um, you know, diversity, it, it's going to show up in, in how they allocate resources. But when we look at those amounts of money, those are just drops in the bucket compared to the value that these organizations would actually realize, both from a brand standpoint, from a, you know, public uh, perception standpoint, but also a concrete and tangible value that diversity brings to your organizations. Until organizations, and I think we're at a point where organizations, you know, the studies are there. They understand that diversity is something to be sought after. But at the end of the day, you have people making the decisions. You have people who are shaped and colored by the experiences that they have, by the love or the bias or the discrimination or, you know, the, the desire to educate and help. Um, and until we have processes and the companies 
put in place the same types of mechanisms that they use to increase their their revenue year over year or their you know user experience year over year till they start to put that type of rigor behind diversity we're not going to see a change and so that's what i i you know i request that these companies do take a seriously look serious look at you know what is the root or underlying cause of why we don't have enough diversity here? And how do we put real dollars, real resources, real time, real incentives towards making those changes? Well, right. I, th I think the other thing too, and, and this has always been my, you know, I've been doing this for so long, uh, but too often I think the companies only think in terms of the next year or the next two years. And I think the key, to try and changing their mindset is looking out beyond two years. And if you look at the response in Europe, in Asia, in South America, Australia, of many whites and blacks demonstrating, this is gonna be the world very soon. And if they don't have representation, they can, how many CEOs, how many board members probably in these major corporations would even envision, you know, 24 hours after Floyd was killed, the reaction that you would see in London, where knocking mm -hmm. over things in Africa, they're knocking over Leopold's statue. This is a new world we're living in. And if you start thinking the same way you've been thinking for the last 40 years, and you're not aware how fast it's changing and the complexity of the change, they're gonna lose money. The competition is gonna come and take them out. Yep. I mean, just, you're gonna take them out. So this is I always I always talk. So I always think about money. I say, really, you got <laughs> no, you're money. right on. You are right <laughs> on. It comes back to the money, and we always say at we saw that when we're, we're talking to companies, you know, the companies who get diversity right first are the companies who are going to win. That's and right. because no nobody has it right right now, we're able to continue. But the second that changes you are going to see a shift, a, a quick and swift shift towards companies realizing the importance and the value that diversity brings because it not only helps them uh, operate as a better organization, but it helps them reach and expand, you know, their, their audience and uh, ultimately their revenues. Right, and get better talent. Yep. Yep. We have a comment from, I believe, a young professor uh, and I'd like all three of you to think about what this person says and maybe have a reaction to it. Uh, he says, tenure track minority faculty at business schools face enormous pressure to do research and publish. While we recognize the extreme importance of mentoring students of color, it's the challenge to be the one, not having to mentor ourselves, also being accessible to students. James, what do you think of that? Yeah, I'm trying to be straight, but I, I, I hear what he's saying or she's saying, I don't know if it's a male or female, but you know, I'm a consultant. So I'm just saying, how are you managing your time? I think I've been around some of the greatest professors ever and they were able to do both. Mm -hmm. You know, they can do both and they did get chapter and they did get tenure and they did write books. Some of your best professors who've been the best mentors for younger people irrespective of race have written one, two, three, four, and five books. So I think it's how you manage your time. How, how do you put the priorities? I'm not saying tenure, you gotta make tenure, because it's just like being a, a consultant, you gotta make partner. So mm -hmm. it's the same thing. And so don't, and I, and I just had a- I'd like to add, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to add on an additional perspective. And I'll say, whether we're talking about tenured professors if we're talking about entrepreneurs who are, you know, one of very few, whether we're talking about consultants making partner track or, you know, lawyers making partner track, as black leaders, you are called upon to do so much more than your peers. And I think that's a real concern. Not only are you expected to do the job that you're there for, you're expected to be the role model and the leader. You're called upon when there needs to be conversations about race and how we can help bring more. You're also called upon 
you know, to do better and be better. That's something that I think, you know, I don't know if, if you know this, but pretty much every African American person that I know has been taught you have to do more and be better to get the same thing or even get close to it. And so that's probably the sentiment that this professor I think is expressing. And mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I'm not familiar with the tenure track, you know, responsibilities, but I would imagine that they're not gonna have the same responsibilities as their white peers. And unfortunately, you know, that's just the world that we live in. I don't think it is fair, um, you know, on top of, all of us black folks here managing this within our organizations, our own, you know, experiences with what's going on right now. We're here right now because we're choosing to and making that, you know, something that we prioritize. But that's no small feat because we have a number of other things and another number of other resources that are, are calling upon us. And I think it's something that, you know, the leaders and, and non-black folk who ask those things of us should be considering as well. Yeah, but even there, I mean, if you, if you deal with it, get back the money. I mean, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I've seen it. I designed these programs, and the one person is always asked to do this, to do that, because they're the only Black or they're yeah. highest ranking Black. And it's time. It takes time away from your, your prime responsibilities within the corporation or the partnership. And what I tell companies, I said, don't have a Black tax. And they'll look at me like I'm crazy. Yep. I'm saying, no, it's a black tax. You don't put a black, you don't put a white tax on people. So if you got, and I tell them two or three things. I say, look, if you got put a black tax on them, pay them. I mean, if it, it's a different, if, if you're going to put all that extra stuff on them, pay them more. Because they're, that is a value they're, they're attributing to give to your company. I think that. The other thing I tell them, you're going to drive them out. And I've seen this. And I'm sure you have, Stella, and I'm sure you have Paul. You, they'll, you'll drive out those superstars that you trained all this time, all this money you invested to recruit them, to train them, retain them. You're going to lose them. Because they said, I got to get out of here. I'm not getting the reward, psychic reward, the respect professional rewards, and, and, and the financial rewards to do all this. I got to leave. And they yeah. do. Yeah. Um, I would probably... Uh, lean towards uh, what James mentioned about time management. And then I also think about something that I've heard in the past where uh, you can juggle many balls well, just maybe not at the same time. And so is there a way that you could figure out um, when those students need the support the most, in which case perhaps at that time you spend the majority of your time with the students, but then is there another time in the cycle where then you can then focus on your writing and the other um, needs that you have all oh, outside of family and life, right? So maybe it's in the fall when they're doing recruiting, when they're first starting and they need a little bit more support and then uh, maybe you can focus on writing perhaps in the spring as an example of what I mean by figuring out how to juggle the different balls. But I'm an optimist, but I would like to think that mentoring young people is one of the rewards of being a teacher. Yeah. Uh, and it's a reward Absolutely. that gives back endlessly to you far more than a piece of research in an esoteric journal that maybe a handful of people in the world will ever read and fewer will understand. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, let's, uh, let's uh, round up with where do we go from here? James, your earlier comments suggested that you were fairly optimistic that we might see real change now. Um, but you know, talk is cheap and we, our society suffers from uh, attention deficit syndrome. And um, my fear is that maybe the moment won't be completely seized and we won't achieve the progress or advance that we really need at this time. So James, make the case for being the optimist maybe. <laughs> I'm always the optimist. I, you know, and I always try and you know, keep looking at the glass half full. And I'm not saying this, Paula or Stella, to sell my book, but in my book, you know, which is called Change Agent, I have a whole chapter on what I think black people should do differently. Now I do have another chapter on 
open letter to the next generation, irrespective of race, in what I'm doing. And, and I list 10 things that I think black people ought to do differently. And, I, and, and a lot of it learning from the past mm. and where we are now, but I'm still gonna focus, and this is me, you know, I think there's still two roads down here. I think there's education, but I think it's economic development. And until we can start thinking differently about how we're gonna play a role here. And so I list 10 things that we should do in terms of, and, I, and I, I'm not gonna go over the whole thing, but I'm just saying it starts with just accepting the mindset that capital is key. Just like I talk about historically black colleges with no endowments, I could go on and on and on. If we don't have capital, we can't affect change for our people and for our society. And I go into you know, things like we have to do research. We have to leverage, leverage in a different kind of way the, the, the minimal number of people we have in C-suites. But the role of the, of the blacks in C-suites has to change and how they're using it. If you're talking about minority business, which has been my field, we've had the Ford example you gave, we, we were able to create the first billion dollar procurement program by using a very simple process, letting Jesse come in the door of one, me working with the person assigned to me, and getting to Cliff Wharton, who at the time was the president of Michigan State, who was on the board. And all he did was every quarter ask, what are we doing with minority business? And with that, we were able to get a billion dollars. But I'll leave the last one. And I, I know Paula and Ella, I think I know you now, but I know your reaction to be. And I said, the 10th thing we gotta do is stop having crabs in the uh, barrel mentality. You know, I think if we can't work together as black people using all the brilliance that like these two that I've been exposed to today and people I've been in the past, that we keep fighting each other every time one gets in and, and pulls the other one down, we will never, ever have it. Yeah, that's true. And uh -huh. I'd like to challenge us to think about what are the systems, what are the situations that have created that, 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 um, that symptom, that, that crabs in the barrel mentality? Um, right. I think that's something that is very real, but at the same time, I think there's also a really strong movement and focus of Black folks supporting Black folks. I think it goes, we have to look outside of ourselves and what we can do and look at the systems that are in place that perpetuate this disadvantage or in you know being frank racism and address those systems those systems that are largely controlled by white men and so when we say where do we go from here i think there's something that everyone plays a role in you know from black folks to other minorities to women to white men across the board, you know, everyone has a role. It's the same systems of racism or discrimination or inequity that is applied to one group that is later used to an, for another group. And I think when we root out those systems, when we keep the focus, you know, the, the foot on, on the pedal, on eliminating those systems, first understanding them and then eliminating them, that's when we'll see, you know, real change and real difference. Yeah, but I think that the combination, and I'm not rebutting it, but I think the combination, we've seen these systems. I mean, I, when I started my journey in, in the early, late 50s, early 60s, we saw those systems. So yeah. we knew who was on our neck. Mm -hmm. We knew all the people that were doing that. So the question then becomes, how can we be united in dealing with those givens? And that's why I do spend a lot of time in that one chapter and where I feel confident, John, is when I see, and, and you're seeing in a lot of different ways and even earlier, where people of color are working with people who are not of, of color, working together. And I think you have now, and this is my hope, the younger generation of young whites, blacks, Hispanics, gays, lesbians, are now looking at the systems and challenging the systems working together. So I think, I think it's two parts. One, I think we have to be stronger in leading the battle using with all the people in our society and all the leadership in our society, but working with others to make a change. Because I think the younger generation wants to make a change and, and it's very important and we should support it.
I would agree 100% and, and agree a little bit about um, what each of you said, right? So how do we as Blacks do a better job of supporting ourselves? So now yes. I feel like the light has been shined now on um, this movement or the disparities. So do are we spending enough of our dollars in the Black community to support Black businesses and entrepreneurs, if not start doing it? That's the way that we affect change. And then if you are an organization or someone who's not in the minority, how can you partner with a minority? Perhaps it is supplier diversity, perhaps it is um, lending more funds to a small business. Maybe it's partnering with a diverse organization to help them um, with your systems and processes internally so that you can have more um, fairness and in, in equity. So that is how we affect change. And in essence, it has to be action. We have to be called to action. And that's the only way we will change and that we will not have great work that James mentioned from 1969 that's still a book on a shelf that hasn't been cracked open. <laughs> yeah, Paula, this is, this is a Monday morning kind of thing. <laughs> if, if you have a call with me, I'll give you an hour and a half of my life. I respect what you've done and what your, your organization has done. And I will give you free consulting on ways which I think you could uh, strengthen your organization, get more support and financial support, to make it even stronger than it is today. So I, that is my commitment to you. I will honor it. There you go. Free consulting help from a giant in the field. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Thank you. Listen, th thank you for sharing your insights and your experiences. I really appreciate it. I'm sure that our audience will too. Uh, and I pray for change and progress uh, because there certainly hasn't been enough. And um, hopefully we'll see it in our lifetimes. Great. Stella, thank you. James, a pleasure to meet you. Paula, thank you so much. Thank you all. It was great to meet thank you. you. Thank you. All right. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching. <laughs>